Furry had uh, had a career in the in the twenties. Twenty seven was his last recordings, and then went to work for the city of Memphis, cleaning the streets of the city of Memphis on a prosthesis. He had one leg, and uh, he did that for you know twenty years, and then he retired just about the time that all of these people were being rediscovered. And of course, Ferg was always very gracious about having people into his house. He liked to entertain him. He was, he was a good host. It was a great scene over there. Fur would take his leg off and put it on, on the floor and be there in his bed. I can remember taking Stephen over there. Stephen adored Ferg Lewis. And he was two or three. Stephen would get up on the bed and Ferg kept a, a, a cigar box uh, in which he had his, his cigarette lighter and his cigarettes and uh, his, his a half pint of tin high and his pistol in there. And uh, so we were over there one time, Stephen's up on the bed and we were just sitting there chalking the first little legs on the floor and it's just the three of us. And I look up and there's Steve with the pistol pointing right at Furry's head. And I said, Furry don't move. I said, he just got his hands on the handle, you know. But, you know, he's got your pistol. I said, don't move, I'm coming over to, to, to take it away. You know, I said, give me the pistol, Steve. Steve asked me the pistol. I said, I'm gonna take the cigar box, we're gonna move it over here. And uh, I don't even know if Stephen remembers that. Uh, again, music is raceless. So you would go out to clubs and there would be people like Marvel Thomas and, and, and Andrew Love and, and people like that. And all these, you know, I wasn't a real player, but I could get up and sing with people. So I could sit in and sing with people. And nobody cared whether you were black or white. But after Dr. King got killed especially, there was some tension. But Ferry was still there and he was an older generation. And for us, it was a gentler way into the African-American community for somebody coming out of that kind of prejudicial Southern Delta culture. Furry was the perfect vehicle for, for, for me to, to, to integrate me into a larger society. That, that, you know, we still got humongous problems in the city, but there were people like Furry Lewis on the ground that totally peeled the scales off a lot of the white children's lives and were integrated within the arts community. And, 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 and it was, it was just, we, we felt raceless, we did. You know, we all got thrown into jail together, not because we were out protesting. It's because a cop would see a black and white child getting off the bus going into a party. There'd be all kinds of marijuana and stuff like that. They could have busted us and sent us all to jail for six years. And they would come in and bust us because we were black and white at a party playing music and just having a good time. He was, he, he was probably the most important person in my life other than my father and my grandfather the most, and Tom Rohn. I would say Ferry Lewis is the most important male figure in my life with those other three, you know. And that's a lot to be said, I mean, you know. And, you know, with us, it's not so much, there's, there's some great, fun, funny furry stories that everybody can tell, but behind all of that, there's this great love and affection and, and, and gratitude for who Furry Lewis was, you know. I mean, I don't, I don't know a person that knew him well that didn't feel that way about Furry. He's one of the finest gentlemen I've ever met in my life.